All right, good afternoon. My name is David Moore. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, first, I want to say thank you so much to the staff and volunteers and all the participants as well, the B-Sides. I'm a huge fan of B-Sides. I love B-Sides, so it's really nice to be here. And um, just to get started, a few details about my background. I became a professional developer of software in 1994. Had the opportunity to work for some pretty great companies, great people in engineering, sales, consulting, and business development roles. And um, that was very cool. I was having a really cool career in that. Uh, early on in my career, I got the chance to work for Next, to work with Steve Jobs, not directly, but um, I was actually one manager away from him. Uh, one of my managers left, and it took him months to set up a uh, new manager. So I reported to the VP of uh, Professional Services, and he reported to Steve. So that was interesting. That went great, though. Got bought by Apple in one of the biggest acquisitions ever. Um, went on to uh, you know, some other really cool companies. And, um, but after about 10 years of that, I decided to take a break and kind of move into consulting. And so there I'm called consulting in Indonesia and uh, got a chance to do that for a little while. And continuing my break, I actually also spent a few years as an opera singer. I trained in opera and was able to get to the professional level, semi-professional, frankly, and that was cool, but I took it about as far as I could. I wasn't really loud enough, and sometimes I had trouble with the high notes, so that's not gonna work. And at the same time, I was seeing, you know, I was always following tech and wanting to get back into tech, and I was seeing a lot of amazing um, things happen in the security space, even going back as far as Stuxnet and some of the really big hacks of 2012. And so I started doing security as kind of a hobby thing, just kind of doing, um, uh, vulnerable web apps, things like that. And about three years ago, though, I decided to, to really um, go into a full time and concentrate 100% on offensive security. So, um, so I started participating in bug bounty programs. Uh, my apologies. Small slides show glitch. Sorry about that. And so I, these bug bounty programs are awesome, and I was working mostly through Bug Crowd and Cobalt and HackerOne. And so these let you hack websites without worrying about um, being sued or being interrogated. And if you find a vulnerability and, and report it responsibly, it's really nice because you can get some money back from it. But really more importantly, it's the recognition that you get from it, as well as the training. It, you learn a lot hitting real websites. Um, and so. Uh, I did that for a while. I found stuff in Google. Uh, full disclosure, that was a couple of Google uh, acquisitions, a couple of different ones. Um, and so that went great. But then I was thinking about getting my certificate, Offensive Security uh, OSCP, and I knew they had stuff about memory corruption and things like that. And I didn't know that much about it at the time, but I decided to start studying that. And I really got into it. And so I essentially started doing that only and moved away from the web stuff pivoted into fuzzing and memory corruption. And I was mostly using a new fuzzer called AFL. It stands for, uh, short for American Fuzzy Lope. And this is developed uh, at Google by a guy named Mikhail Zaluski. And it's a groundbreaking new fuzzer and it's very, very powerful. And, um, and then I started a company called Fuzz Station. I got so into fuzzing, I started a company last summer called Fuzz Station. And we offer fuzz testing at scale in the cloud. And okay, so enough about me. Uh, we're gonna talk about the talk outline today. When I first started fuzzing, I wondered to myself, okay, what am I gonna do if I found a crash? The fuzzer is powerful, you can make things crash. But I didn't really know what I would, how I'd handle that. What do I do if I found one? So I worked it out through just reading and trying lots of stuff. And this talk is the results of that. So we're gonna be addressing today memory corruption issues in C and C++ programs. And I kind of call this the middle section of the process. So I'm not going to talk about um, doing a fuzzer on, or what I call the art of fuzzing, which is choosing a fuzzer, choosing seed files, how long to do a fuzz run for. Uh, that's been pretty well covered in a couple of talks in 2016. And we're also not going to talk about exploit development. That's definitely far beyond the scope 
of this talk or what I know. So it's really the middle. You've done the fuzz run, you've got a bunch of crashes, what do you do? The goal is to get to the point where you can triage those crashes, understand if they're exploitable or not, uh, and also to an extent um, start down the road of maybe finding the bug if debugging is your goal. And so we're going to introduce, we're going to do a quick review of memory corruption bugs, go through the workflow I developed, and then look at a couple of real world examples from my research. And so here's a quick review of memory corruption bugs. Um, really, a lot of times they come down to invalid reads and writes. What do we really mean by memory corruption? And to really reduce it down, it's invalid reads or writes. If you can coerce a program to read or, or write outside the bounds of where it's supposed to on any given buffer or environment, uh, I'm sorry, variable, that's what we call, consider an invalid read or write, also called an out of bounds read or write, uh, sometimes abbreviated as OOB reads and writes, you'll see. And just real quickly, the broad causes of this kind of memory corruption are so often um, many, many cases of off by one errors. So I see off by one errors in over half of the crashes that, that I find. And then certainly unvalidated input uh, can, can cause problems. And in some cases still the use of, unknown, of known unsafe functions in C, like stir copy and get string uh, can cause quite a few problems. And so in a process, there's two areas of memory, the stack and the heap. Uh, either can be corrupted. Local variables are stored on the stack. So if you're doing int x equals 5, that's going to go on the stack. Um, memory obtained or uh, using malloc, like in a string buffer, that's going to be located on the heap. Any heap memory uh, that's been obtained with malloc has to be explicitly freed with a call to free. If not, things can go south quickly. We'll cover that a little bit later. Heap and stack buffer overflows are pretty common still, so we see a lot of them both. Uh, in general, stack buffer overflows are getting harder and harder to exploit, so uh, most of the attention is being pointed at the heap at this point. And one quick note, you'll hear the word stack overflow. Strictly speaking, that's when recursion gets out of control. That's not a memory corruption bug. So if recursion, it just keeps going and you keep pushing frames and frames and frames on the stack, eventually the stack is either going to meet the heap or something else is going wrong. If it's in a browser in JavaScript, uh, sometimes that will get caught. And so this is distinct from what we're going to talk about today, which is a stack-based buffer overflow. Um, in fact, here's a quick example of one. Really simple, if you have a, a program with main, it takes an argument from the command line as input, creates a character array of size 8, and then you use a known unsafe function like stir copy and buff copy the argument from the command line into there. That'll work fine up until you send it more than eight characters. So here we're sending it 12 capital A's and that will definitely overflow by four bytes. So that's a simple example of a stack buffer overflow. Um, and so what happens when freeze not ca called pro properly on uh, memory obtained with malloc? This is another kind of memory corruption bug called uh, use after free, commonly called a UAF. And this is just what it sounds like when a program continues to use a pointer that's already been freed. These are highly likely to be exploitable, especially in C++ code. They often show up during error conditions and corner cases. So anytime it might be unclear who or what part of the program is responsible for freeing malloc memory, if that's not really clearly laid out, you can definitely run into the use after free vulnerability. For instance, who frees, the caller or the callee of a function? If that's not clearly laid out, you're going to see these. And here's a quick example of a UAF. And so here we have um, a pointer to character, four bytes. We do something with it. We free it. Some more stuff happens, and we forget we freed it. Or maybe there's an error condition. Maybe there's a bug. And so we dereference that again, and, um, and that's a, your standard UAF error. And then there's other kinds of memory corruption bugs as well. Um, certainly a double free, or an invalid free it's also called, is when you call free a second time. So distinct from UAF, where you call free and then uh, dereference it, in this case you're calling free and then you call free on it again. And so those are pretty hard to exploit directly. They can be under race conditions in uh, multi-threaded applications. However, almost more importantly is that a lot of double frees can be leveraged into a use after free. 
So there might be a code path that results in a double free, but if you see one, there probably, or there may well be another code path where instead of being freed a second time erroneously, uh, the pointer's dereferenced, and then you have a UAF. So anytime I see a double free, I'm definitely gonna be pretty interested in trying to leverage that into a UAF somehow, try to find another path through the program. Another kind of memory bug is when a conditional depends on an uninitialized variable. So if you just say int x, and then immediately say if x, then do something, uh, you have a conditional or a branch that's based on a completely un uninitialized values, and that can make a control flow attack possible. And then finally, uh, last kind of other kind of memory bug is uh, memory leaks, and we're all probably pretty familiar with those, and that's so if free never gets called. If the programmer forgets to call free or the control flow path never reaches a free. And that's just gonna use up lots and lots and lots of memory, and in that case, you are um, potentially exposed to a DOS attack. So if a programmer or an, uh, uh, an adversary can leverage that again and again, use lots and lots of memory, it'll exhaust the system and uh, exhaust the process and bring it to a halt. All right, and so next, um, what is exploitability? What do we mean by it? Actually, before we go on to this, I wanna see if there's any questions. Anybody have any questions about anything here so far? Yeah. Yeah, the question is what about languages like REST and Go that are memory, um, memory managed or even Java or C Sharp? And this, this kind of fuzzing really just targets crashes. And so it's really only um, uh, leverageable against C and C++ programs. And the idea of fuzzing generally is that you, you throw lots of you know, garbage data, lots of random data, unexpected data at an application, and then you monitor for some anomalous condition. And so normally what we're talking about today and most fuzzers uh, in C and C++, the anomalous condition is a crash. And so you send it lots of weird data and try to make a crash. But certainly, my, I have an idea that maybe you could do the same thing with memory managed programs, but you just have to monitor for other anomalous conditions, and the tricky part is, is defining those. And so, um, so that's kind of the idea, you know, in memory managed cases, how you might be able to fuzz them. Yeah, thank you. Yes, over here. So the question is, if, if a conditional depends on an uninitialized variable, like um, where do you see that? Um, I haven't seen it a whole lot. I've seen it a few times. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's sort of just like a standard programming error. Um, you know, you're always supposed to initialize whenever you write, and so, um, so it's really just bad programming. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah, so the, the point is, is that the compiler will catch that, and, um, and that's, that's a good point. Um, I, I, I have seen it a few times in code I've, I've worked on, um, and so, but, but thank you for that. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, so what we mean by exploitability is essentially one way to think about it, or one version of it is reprogramming with input data and not code. So if we can trick the program into attacking uh, and executing attacker controlled input data as if it were code, then we have a code injection in, uh, exploit. There's a pretty famous hacker named Halvar. Uh, he's at Google Project Zero now, and he has an idea, a way to express this. He says input streams become instruction streams. Or, from an attacker's perspective, can I make your program run my program? And so this typically involves controlling either EIP and 32-bit programs or RIP, the instruction pointer, RIP and 64-bit. If you can get control of that, then you can point it at, um, at maybe some code you've injected. Uh, however, injection attacks have been really well mitigated over the years. It's really hard to get shell code uh, or custom code into a process now because of a lot of mitigations that have gone on. So most of the exploits that we're seeing now are reprogramming with existing code in the process. So rather than injecting new code, we're doing a code reuse attack. So as opposed to a code injection attack, this is a code reuse exploit. And this is called return-oriented programming. It relies on manipulating the return pointer on the stack to make this happen. 
ROP, it's also called ROP, and it's also technically called weird machine programming. And it's not easy. There's, the idea is that you leverage um, code, and this is already compiled code, um, and you need to string a bunch of this stuff together to get what you want, typically popping a shell. And there are tools that will um, essentially search a uh, process or for, uh, you know, for different chunks of code you might want to use. And you have to tie them together and it can be like a Rube Goldenberg machine if you've seen these or like, you know, when like the ball comes down and bounces and like, I mean, it can be really hard to run these things, but this is how um, most, most exploits go uh, these days. And then does exploitability matter? Um, why does it matter? So, I mean, sort of yes and no. I mean, a crash should be fixed. If you're aware of a memory um, uh, corruption vulnerability or, or bug, it's good to fix it. Uh, however, prioritization is important too. Perhaps there's many bugs to fix. It's important to know which are exploitable, which are not, if you're uh, involved with maintaining some code. And also, certainly if you're doing white hat work and reporting the bugs, it's pretty important to know how exploitable they are for a couple reasons. First of all, you want to motivate the vendors or the maintainers to fix. So if you can show or demonstrate or, or uh, given a good idea that there's some kind of exploitability, that's going to motivate them to fix it. Another point is that when you report a bug, uh, you have sort of a choice in a lot of open source cases or other situations as well, where you can call it a security bug or not. And in open source code, a lot of times you, um, if you report it as a security bug, it won't be in the bug tracking system. It won't be uh, publicly available, which is good. Um, because if you were to report something otherwise that is in the, in the bug tracking tool, you might have just dropped a zero day. Like if it's a really critical bug and you didn't know that and you just reported it, it's like boom, it's out there. And then the other side of the coin also is that you don't want to cry wolf. You know, like you want to really, if you report something as security um, a vulnerability, you want it to really be one because you know, sometimes the developers are sort of like pushing back a little bit, right? And so you want to have a good case that it is exploitable. And then it's a matter of exploitable by whom? Uh, there's lots of, there's a broad range of exploit dev um, capability out there. So certainly Project Zero, I talked about them before, they have some great hackers. Uh, and other groups certainly have a very, very high level of really great people and lots and lots of resources. Uh, this is um, uh, one agency, we heard about the CIA very recently doing similar things. And certainly, who else? Who knows who else? Like, I believe that probably every country has some kind of offensive capability and there's other groups and whatever. So the general idea, and just to reiterate, we all know this, but security is never 100%. What we're trying to do is raise the cost to the attacker. We want it to be more expensive to run the hack than, it is, than the value of the data or whatever nefarious purpose is going on uh, might be to the attacker. And then one other important point is that most exploits nowadays are bug chains. It's not just one bug. It's chaining two, three, four bugs together to reach uh, an exploitable situation. And so an unexploitable bug, one that's definitely not exploitable, could still play a critical role in a bug chain that might lead to an exploit like an RCE. And then one more uh, important point here is that some bugs are really surprisingly exploitable. They wouldn't seem that way at first. There was a bug uh, recently disclosed in um, a DNS library called C Aries. This is in the Chrome OS. And a researcher, or researchers, they're anonymous, found a remote code execution that was um, pretty bad. And, but what's interesting about it is that it was just a one byte overwrite. And so, and it was only a single byte overwrite uh, past the buffer. And not only that, but it was always the digit one. So the attacker in this case could not control what got written in there. And this was reported, there's a 37 page report I didn't read, but this was reported by uh, um, anonymous researcher researchers. And it was rate initially related as moderate security impact. And, but a 37 page report proved that it could gain uh, complete remote code execution. So very, very serious bug. And here's another, um, another page about it. And the way this kind of bug would happen is with a te technique called heap grooming, where you make lots and lots and lots of calls ahead of time to arrange the heap in, a, in an exploitable manner. And here's the trigger. This is what triggered this bug. And so this is a DNS library, so a typical DNS name, but if there was a trailing escape dot, 
uh, that would trigger this bug. And this is the kind of thing that, um, you know, we don't know how they found this, but uh, strongly suggests that fuzzing might have had, played a role in this. Okay, and then I would like to go over a few um, mitigations that have made exploitability a lot harder in the last 10 or so years. The first one is stack canaries. And a stack canary is just a random integer pushed onto the stack in between stack frames. So just like a canary in a coal mine, a uh, stack canary indicates when something has gone very wrong. It's time to stop the program. Uh, the way it works, this is one way to look at it, stack frames, and you've got your canaries in between there. Uh, it is a random integer, so this may be a little bit wetter, uh, better way to visualize it. And so if an attacker can make a, uh, a stack-based uh, buffer overflow attack, they can't cross the boundary into the next stack frame. And that's typically one, what you want to do, because that's where the juicy pointers are a lot of times. So in this case, if an attacker wanted to do an overwrite, had a bad write, the attacker would have to have these numbers and recreate them. But the attacker doesn't and can't get them. This is in the OS. It's not available to the attacker. And the operating system will check these numbers every time um, a stack uh, is accessed. So if there's, something's gone wrong with these numbers, they're not what they used to be, uh, that's a clear indication that there's a hack going on. It's time to stop the program. Uh, next up is data execution prevention. And this simply marks some region of the memory, or several, as non-executable. So it says there's never going to be any executable code in here. It's always going to be data. So if the execution pointer ever points here, that means something's going on, time to stop the program. This is supported at the hardware level by the NX bit, and it's present in modern CPUs. And so the combination of stack canaries and data execution prevention has made exploiting, especially stack bugs, a lot more difficult. Uh, one more really important mitigation is ASLR, address space layout randomization. In this case, um, the OS scrambles the memory. It kind of shuffles the memory. So just like we and you buy a deck of cards, they're in order by number and suit, but you shuffle them, and that throws them out of order. A little nicer way to maybe visualize it, just as we map virtual memory to physical memory, uh, ASLR adds another level of remapping over that. And what this does is that even if an attacker can control the execution pointer, they don't know where to jump to, maybe to start their rope chain. Maybe they have a target where they know some good code is that they want to run, but they don't have the real address of it. They have a scrambled address of it. And so it makes it very difficult for them to jump there and run the attack. Now, one thing about ASLR, it's not very effective on 32-bit systems. 32-bit uh, systems have only a 4-gig heap size. And so random heap spraying attacks can sometimes work. So this is sort of a brute force or you know, many, many times attacks. But you're sort of targeting a section of code you're hoping to jump to. And if on one of the executions you do jump there, then, then you're in business. So 64-bit um, is a different matter. ASLR is very, very effective. OK, and that kind of concludes the memory corruption review. We're going to talk about the workflow. Uh, before we do, are there any questions on anything we've covered so far? Um, is, I, I'm not, um, is that, when did that come out? Pretty recently? Last week or two? Or February 15th? Yeah, I'm, I don't, I'm not, um, I'm not really familiar with that. I remember when it came out, yeah, uh, this is a, uh, there was a JavaScript attack on ASLR. I do remember what you were talking about, and, um, it, it's important. I mean, I, I didn't get a chance to really study it as much as I would have liked, but it's, it, it was a really interesting attack. I don't know how, how likely it is to be leverageable. Um, but um, uh, but that was a really cool that was a really cool thing yeah it was a bug that allowed um, JavaScript to defeat ASLR in, in some cases anything else cool okay so the next section we're going to kind of go through the the workflow itself like what do you do once you've done a fuzz run and you've got a bunch of crashes how do you deal with it the steps are to minimize the crash corpus. Uh, use several memory corruption analysis tools to get more information about what's going on. And then finally, determine exploitability or, if, if need be, work on trying to find the root cause of the bug. And so the first thing is minimization. So there's two kinds of minimization. Um, but before we go into that, 
the reason, you know, the idea is you've got a bunch of cases. You've got many cases, like a couple of cut, a couple dozen cases, let's say, that create the crashes. And these cases are files. So many times the fuzzers, they do their best to try to make, their, make each crash a unique case, but it's hard for them to do it during the course of a fuzz run. So you tend to have a lot of cases that really are the same bug. And so, so it's important to, to minimize those, uh, and that's called minimizing the corpus of crashes. And so there's a tool in AFL called AFL CMIN, C-M-I-N. There's also a tool known as C-Reduce that will do this as well. And the idea is to just have fewer, make sure that every crashing case is really distinct as possible. And so that's minimizing the corpus. Once you've done that, it's also important to minimize each crashing case individually. So the fuzzers, you know, just making up random stuff, trying to make things crash, a lot of times the cases that it comes up with has a lot of extraneous bytes, meaning there's, there's material in that file that has nothing to do with the crash. And so to make things uh, easy to debug, uh, it's important to minimize that. There is a tool called AFL Tmin, which handles that for you. And the way it works is that it takes all the bytes and sequentially or uh, tries to remove them and see if the same crash still happens. Uh, if it does happen, if the same crash still happens with that byte removed, uh, then Tmin knows that that's an extraneous byte and it's removed. If the crash doesn't happen, or if a different crash happens, uh, that means that that byte is uh, very important to this case and it stays in the file. So when you're done with both of this, you have, you have fewer cases, and each one is really has only the bytes that are relevant to the crash. And then one final tool that I like to use is called fdupes. And so even after all of this, there are cases where you can have byte for byte identical crashing files, multiple of them. And so what fdupes does is it does an MD5 hash on every file in a directory. And if there's multiple files that have the same MD5 hash, meaning they're byte to byte identical, it'll remove all but one of them for you. So, so that's another nice way just to kind of clean things up and get down to the minimum set of cases. All right, now we're going to go through a few uh, memory corruption analysis tools. Before we get into that, it's important to note that all bets are off. When things go south in a C program, when memory gets corrupted, um, you know, crazy stuff can happen and it can even corrupt the tools or cause the tools to give you, in some cases, erroneous information. So a little bit of skepticism is always very useful. And so the first corruption tool to talk about is called Address Sanitizer. And this is a facility in compilers like GCC and Clang. That is the um, flag that you use to, to, uh, to make sure that you compile with Address Sanitizer. It's often abbreviated as ASAN. And Address Sanitizer operates at both the compile time and the runtime. At compile time, it adds instrumentation into the binary that lets it track memory use. At runtime, it actually replaces the malloc allocation libraries with its own runtime library. And again, it enables it to really track what's going on with the memory and really bring a high degree of accuracy into, into things that it finds. And so here's a quick um, view of it. A little bit hard to read maybe for some people at the back, but it's nice because it tells you uh, address sanitizer. It says use after free on address uh, so-and-so, and it gives you information about the stack pointer and the base pointer as well and a stack trace. In this case, it says a read of size four was found uh, at this memory location. And so it finds invalid reads and writes, UAFs, double freeze, memory leaks, um, uh, issues in both the stack and the heap, and several other things as well. Another really important tool is called Valgrind, or that's actually a family of tools. The tool itself is called memcheck, but a lot of people uh, kind of just say valgrind when they mean memcheck. And memcheck's distinct from address sanitizer because there's no need to recompile. You can run it on any binary. Uh, it does put out lots and lots of input, which needs to be interpreted. And it's also distinct from ASAN in that it'll allow the process to run until the crash. Whereas ASAN will stop as soon as it finds any, any memory corruption error at all, it'll simply stop. And so with Valgrind, you might see more things going on before the crash actually happened, or maybe it's not even a crash. There definitely can be memory corruption bugs that don't result in a crash. And so I like to use them both. I like to use Valgrind and ASAN because they kind of give different perspectives on the crash. 
Uh, one important thing to note, though, is that they don't play very well together. If you try to uh, run Valgrind on an ASAN compiled binary, uh, you're going to get an error. It doesn't, doesn't work out. They don't like each other very much. And so Valgrind's very accurate as well. And here's a quick example of the output and a little tough to read, but it's saying invalid write of size 8, uh, and it gives the stack trace for that, as well as the uh, memory location. And then down a little lower, you have an invalid read of size 4. So anytime you see a, a bad write in the heap, uh, that's, that's a bad thing, especially if you have a write and a read. Then a, the attacker a lot of times can manipulate things and turn that into an exploitable bug. And then finally, a uh, last tool called Exploitable, just simply called Exploitable, and this was developed by CERT. It's now been open source and available on GitHub. It's maintained by a person named Jonathan Foote, F-O-O-T-E, and so under jfoot slash exploitable, you'll find this. It's a, an extension to GDB, and it, but it also includes a script to run it outside the context of GDB. And it's written in Python. What I really like about it is that it attempts, it does its best to categorize uh, the crash. And so in this case, we have it saying that this is in category exploitable. This is the example of output of the tool exploitable. And it gives you a really nice ex explanation as well. And so it's saying here, the target's backtrace indicates libc has detected a heap error, or that the target was executing a heap function when it stopped. And so, so it's pretty, uh, pretty handy, uh, pretty handy tool. Again, you want to be a little skeptical. You want to do your best to to verify these things. Um, the tool exploitable will use um, or offers four different categories uh, for crashes. Those are exploitable. Uh, probably exploitable, this could be a stack buffer overflow. Probably not exploitable, so that's uh, not like things like a null pointer dereference or maybe a floating point exception. And then it'll categorize, categorize things as unknown as well. There's times when it just doesn't have enough information to say what's going on with the crash. In that case, you need to dig, dig down a little bit further. And so altogether, these tools give a great deal of information about what's going on. It'll put you in good shape to to kind of manage the next step, which is uh, just determining exploitability, digging down to the root cause of it. Before we go on, any questions at this point? Okay, so one important thing to do before you start working is to disable ASLR. And so the reason for that is if you, you know, if you don't, you're gonna have different memory locations on every execution of the program, and that's gonna make it extremely dis difficult to debug. And so, and certainly you want to do this carefully. You don't want, want to use this with, with caution behind uh, a NAT router or a firewall or something like that. This is the uh, command on Ubuntu to disable ASLR temporarily. And it's in a uh, file called randomize underscore VA underscore space. And that's under proc, so you can't just uh, use VI or another editor. You have to echo a zero into it to turn it off. Uh, this, if you turn it off this way, when you reboot, you'll have ASLR back, back, in, uh, back in shape. So, um, and another thing is like, I, I like to fuzz on 32-bit. I like to work on 32-bit a lot. And so um, if you're already on 32-bit anyway, I said before, ASLR is not as effective there. So disabling ASLR is not necessarily as, as bad of a thing on 32-bit. And then really the next step that I like to do, and I even write these down, is to really understand what the critical memory locations are. Because it can get a little bit confusing. You're looking at lots of, lots of hex, lots of memory locations, dumping lots of things. And so it can be confusing about you know, where the crash happened, was it you know, what instruction, where in the heap, whatever. And so I like to write these down. And the first step is to understand, is it a code? You know, is it a memory location for code, or is it for data? So, where the crash happened itself, that's going to be a code location. Maybe where an invalid read or write occurred, that's going to be uh, in data. Where m the memory in location was allocated or freed, where in the code that happened. And then maybe during the course of the program, the data is reassigned to another variable or copied, moved around, things like that. And that's actually going to be the both code and data that, that you're going to need to track in that case. And once you do that, it's time for GDB. Um, and so I spend a lot of time in GDB. Uh, first thing to mention is you, you definitely want to recompile with dash G and dash capital O zero. Uh, dash G will get you the symbols. Uh, 
get to the function names, and, and you definitely want things also not optimized. And so the usual approach is to set a breakpoint where the crash happened, and then run the target with what I call canary values. So in this case, capital A's are really nice. They turn out to be uh, in hex 4.1. That's the ASCII number for capital A. And the reason to do this is that it's really easy to see once you start dumping memory and trying to figure out, you know, kind of where the memory wound up, the memory input, or maybe trying to do an overflow. Where did the overflow wind up? And it's really easy to see the uh, lots of 41s together. If you see that in the wrong place, um, you know you've, you've got something going there. And so, and the general approach is to set a breakpoint where the crash happens and work backwards. And so, a lot of times you need to set breakpoints a little sooner in the control flow to really understand uh, how things got to the point where uh, the memory corruption happened. Other than that, like digging into GDB is definitely outside the scope of today's conversation. Um, one issue with GDP is that GDB is that you often have to run it over and over again a lot of times. It can be pretty tedious. You keep approaching it, you're running the program from start to finish, and it can take a lot of time and it can get pretty confusing. So there's another tool that I like using a lot and it's called RR. And this is, a, uh, again, a plug-in to GDB. This is developed by the Mozilla Foundation, an open source tool. And the way it works is that you first run the program under RR with the input, with the crashing case input. And it will record the execution in a way that once that's done, you can set a breakpoint, again, probably where the crash happened, but you can step backwards, you can reverse time. And so it's almost like a time machine. So you can reverse back up through the control flow uh, of the program. And that can be very powerful. It can be from difficult to triage bugs it's a way to really understand things in a more efficient manner rather than using GDB and going forward in time every, every time and just trying to kind of work your way back up and figure out uh, where things went wrong. A couple of caveats with RR, you can't alter variables like you can in GDB. You can't say, you know, set X equal to five. Uh, you also cannot make calls like you can from the GDB command line. You can actually just make, you know, call a function. Either one of those things will screw up the state of the program which has been recorded by RR and will cause it to crash. And here's a screenshot from the RR, our GitHub, and uh, just talks a little bit about how this works. A very cool tool. I don't use it every time, but if, when things get difficult and tricky, then I definitely go for it. Okay, another thing to keep in mind is that this is, this is tough. I mean, this stuff is gnarly, and a lot of times you're looking at assembly code in some cases. You're looking at lots and lots of data. Um, it takes persistence, but it also takes, you know, taking breaks and just working through things. So I kind of compare it to doing a manual source code review too, just literally looking at code with your eyes, trying to find bugs in it. Uh, it's a great way to find bugs, but um, you, you have about maybe an hour of, of time in your brain where you can really concentrate the level uh, necessary to do that. And I think this kind of crash triage uh, can get to that point too. So uh, one more thing about, uh, about solving these bugs. Once the bugs are fixed, once the crash has been fixed, it's important to refuzz the target because a crash is a dead end for that code path. And so there could well be more crashes, more bugs further down uh, uh, the code path that, that did, did not get discovered because the program crashed. Especially given if you're in an area of the code where there's already a memory corruption bug, uh, that means that there could be more memory corruption bugs. So it's important to go back and, and fuzz those things. Okay, and uh, the last section we're going to talk about some real-world examples I, I found. Uh, before we do, any questions at all on any of this? Yeah. <laughs> okay, the question is, is using our arm properly can make it crash. Is that exploitable? And, I mean, it, it might be. I mean, it actually takes down everything. Like, it takes down, I mean, it's, it's running as a plug-in within GDB. And you're, you know, and you're running a program too. And so if you do either of these things, it just, the whole thing just, just stops. And so, yeah, it, yeah, so yeah, it just generally just stops like crazy. I mean, it's just, um, it's immediately in an unknown state. And so um, I'm not sure how you could exploit that, that directly in terms of attack surface, like how, um, but I mean, you know, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I actually found a, a quick aside, for a while in AFL, in about version 196 or so, 
there was an overflow in AFL. And AFL names files in a, in a particular manner. When it finds a crash, it names it in a, a very particular way that, that lets you kind of manage, the, manage it. And it's a long file name. It's not pretty, it's pretty ugly. But, but I had a couple of cases and I could never reproduce it. But AFL, instead of that file name, it was garbage. Or it actually looked, it, it looked like, like the data in the file. It looked like stuff that had been fuzzed. So there was definitely an overflow in AFL itself too, right? And so these, AFL's written in C. Uh, you know, fuzzer doesn't really, I don't think, has to be written in C, but, but you know, that's not, you know, it's not a bad idea to look at this stuff. I mean, really any security tool should be fuzzed and audited heavily, because uh, we're the ones that use them. Anything else? Yeah. Use PETA, yeah. The question is, do I use PETA, P-E-D-A? And yeah, the answer is yes, yeah. And so I haven't, yeah, actually, I should maybe mention that. Um, um, that's another great tool. And so PETA is also a plug into GDB, but it gives you a really nice printout of, of the stack and, and other information about it, and it does it um, after every time you do a step, right, or a next, things like that, it immediately kind of updates the whole situation. So you see everything at once. Where normal GDB, you do a step and you're still just at the command line, so then you've got to dump this memory, dump that memory, look at the registers, things like that. And so, so yeah, it's called GDB-PEDA, I believe. And it's a plug in a GDB, yeah, highly recommended. All right, and so just to wrap things up, we're going to look at a couple of bugs that I found in my research. Uh, the first one I found in PHP, it was a low, bad read, and low meaning uh, low in the memory space. Uh, definitely not exploitable. I was fuzzing the PHP any file, and which is a weird thing to do because that's typically associated with running in the context of a web server. I was running PHP from the command line, driving it with a fuzzer. And so, but I figured, you know, what the hell. And I found a crash and reported it. However, it's a low read and um, it requires a crafted any file. This, uh, this, uh, this slide is not quite as important as the next one. This is the, the more in interesting uh, slide on this. This is the results of uh, memcheck. And it said there's an invalid read of size four. But down at the bottom it says address 0x10 is not stacked, malloced, or recently freed. And so that means that the read was, was very low in the process space. It was at, um, at hex uh, 10 or 16. And so there's never anything down there. There's never anything interesting to either read or corrupt or anything like that. This is, this is a null pointer dereference. So, not exploitable. In the olden days, sometimes you could uh, exploit these, but those days are gone. And so this is a little tough to read, but this is the diff. And all they did was, this is their fix. And they just checked if they're operating in the context of a web server or not and do the right thing accordingly. And so, you know, so that was cool. It did get fixed. These all have gotten fixed. Um, so I turned my attention to Ruby and started fuzzing that. And this is, this is um, uh, the standard Ruby interpreter. M M R M R MRI, I think it's called. And so I found actually four bugs in this, in the regex engine, and one in unmarshalling. Of the regex bugs, this is the more relevant one for today. And so I was fuzzing the regex itself, meaning what a programmer would write. And so I was fuzzing essentially the compilation of those regexes. And I found a pretty nice bug in that, a heap buffer overflow. And here's the results of ASAN. Address sanitizer said there's a heap buffer overflow at this address, a uh, read of size four, and that is in the heap. And so we have a bad read there. Um, and so that looks, you know, bad reads are, you know, they're hard to exploit. I mean, they're bugs, but they're not really that bad standalone. However, then I ran Valgrind on it, and Valgrind's indicating an invalid uh, write also as well of size four. Uh, and an invalid read also of size 4. So this is, a ASAN just quits at the first corruption it finds. So running Valgrind shows that there's a write too. And these are fairly close together in memory. I apologize, it might be a little hard to read, but the memory locations of the read and write are close. And that suggests that an attacker could probably, um, probably leverage that, probably, get, probably write something and then later read it. And in fact, anytime you have a bad read in the heap, that's uh, considered exploitable. And so this is a pretty good bug. And However, uh, you know, I would consider this definitely exploitable. The good news is that it's tough to exploit this. And so there's not many applications that allow you to upload arbitrary regular expressions, which is also a good thing for uh, an unrelated reason. 
is that it's an easy way to potentially cause a DOS attack. If you allow untrusted regexes to be uploaded into your system, a mal actor could um, use a, essentially a regex bomb or something like that. And so it's, it's already insecure practice anyway. So hopefully the attack surface on this is pretty small and that somewhat ameliorates you know, the fact that this is probably an exploitable bug. And so I reported that and they, they fixed it. The interesting part about this bug as well is it was a really weird corner case. If in the regex you opened a character class that never got closed and there is also an octal number uh, in, the, in the regex, that would cause this crash. So super weird corner case. I mean, it's not surprising there's stuff in here. Um, but this is the kind of thing, again, fuzzers are really good at finding. And then the last one is a bug I found in an uh, open source tool called Netflix Dynamite. I uh, found an invalid write here. Uh, Netflix Dynamite is a replicator and sharder for key value storage systems like Redis and Memcached. And so uh, Netflix uses it, other people do. Netflix uses it definitely at scale and production. I believe they use it essentially between the internet and, and, these, uh, and Redis and Memcached, perhaps to store metadata related to people um, watching movies. And so I fuzzed it, and I fuzzed, um, I fuzzed it in kind of a, an oblique manner. Like, I didn't fuzz it head on. I, I, try, I figure highly audited code bases are pretty well fuzzed, and maybe not, but I mean, I didn't fuzz it head on, uh, meaning like trying to bring in, you know, stuff from the outside internet. I decided just to fuzz the config file, which is a YAML style file. And so, in a way, it's not a great thing to fuzz because even if I find something, that's going to take um, an admin or somebody already authorized to leverage this. So you're only looking at essentially cases where you have a compromised admin or a malicious admin could leverage a thing like this. And I figured maybe it'd be a bug in the YAML as well too. So I fuzzed it, but I found a cool uh, crash. And you can see here sort of on the right-hand side, there's a bunch of A's there and some other garbage. That is the crash case. And then down at the bottom, if you can see it, there's a bunch of 41s that I dumped out of GDB. And so I had a six bytes of contiguous write into the heap. And so that's pretty exploitable. Um, but again, it's like, okay, whatever, it's just in the any file. So I reported it, and to my surprise, it, they traced the bug into their string functions, their string duplication function, how they're handling all strings. And so they had a string library, but they weren't always completely using it. They were sort of writing a little extra string dupe code over that. They weren't completely using it, and that's how they got into trouble. And so I was pretty surprised by this, and so I, I haven't confirmed it, haven't tried to really run the hack, but I think that this could be a pretty serious attack. It's been fixed for a long time, hopefully, and everybody's using it. I reported this in May. And so uh, um, this is the diff where they fixed it, and a little hard to see again, but it's a classic off by one error. So they're trying to manage things uh, lengths of things in doing string dupes by hand in the code uh, rather than relying on the library that they were using. And so that's kind of how they got themselves into trouble. But um, I reported it, they fixed it, and I got into the next Netflix Hall of Fame, uh, which is a nice place to be. Some other pretty good researchers in there. And so that's going to kind of wrap things up. Just the last thing to say is there's a few really important references. Uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute has a, a great course called Modern Binary Exploitation, and they very generously uh, open source the course. So on GitHub, they have a bunch of vulnerable um, programs to practice against, and I think it's on the R RPI site somewhere. You have to search around for it, but they have all of the slides and PDFs. So they essentially have the complete course, and you can easily do what I did, which is just take the course on your own and learn a great deal not just about exploitation and memory corruption, but they cover uh, reverse engineering very well also. And then um, the book is Hacking the Art of Exploitation by John Erickson, um, pretty much a must read for any kind of this, any work like this. I got the version one, the first edition in 2005. Uh, there's another edition out now. Highly recommend that. And then Project Zero is a great blog. And then Sean Helan's a, um, um, uh, he's right now, I believe he's a PhD student but he, he finds a lot of great stuff, and he wrote a great uh, blog post on using the RR. And so uh, that's going to do it. Any questions?
All right, that's great. Thank you guys very much. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Is there a is there a happy hour? Does anybody know if there's any evening uh, activity tonight or what? Any?